thing some people want. Yeah, we're missing. Oh, they'll be late today. All right, when they come in, can we shame them? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so join in a public shaming ritual. Um, no, <laughs> welcome back. Uh, we're going to finish talking about adventures and covariance today. I have a lot to get through, but it's all the same concepts you got last time. So we, we took a leisurely stroll through random slopes or varying slopes or whatever you want to call them, partially pooled slopes, let's call them that, uh, on Wednesday. And I want to give you more examples of how to use those today to help you stretch into this and see how it works. And then we're going to talk about Gaussian processes, which is a natural extension of the partial pooling um, to uh, much more interesting and commonplace uh, things. Okay, so we had finished on Wednesday. I had just introduced, reintroduced this data set you've analyzed before. Remind you, this is UC Berkeley admissions data from the 1970s. Uh, however, this topic is always fresh. Uh, <laughs> and the topic is, is there gender discrimination in higher education? In this case, it's applications to PhD programs. And uh, the outcome variable, uh, A sub I here, is accepted applications. It's a count. And these are uh, binomially distributed under maximum entropy with a uh, maximum of N sub I, which is the number of applications received in that department, uh, and P sub I, the probability of an application being accepted. And this is what we're trying to estimate as a function of a department-specific intercept, alpha sub department, and a department-specific slope, which is the difference in probability of acceptance between a male and female application, right? It's the decrement or increment in log odds that arises from the application being submitted by someone who identifies as male. Yeah? You with me? Um, so n sub i is a dummy variable, 0, 1 dummy variable. And now the part that's different about this model uh, from what we've done before is we have this adaptive prior of bivariate normal distribution that bundles together the department-specific effects, the random effects or varying effects, the partially pooled parameters specific to each department. They come in <coughs> pairs. There's an alpha and a beta for each department, right? And they go into a vector. And these, these pairs are sampled from a bivariate normal distribution where the, the mean is alpha beta. And then there's a covariance matrix, S, which models the covariance between <laughs> the alphas and betas. And it's the modeling this covariance that lets us do the pooling across the slopes, uh, the intercepts and slopes. Yeah, you with me? Um, so this is just like uh, the coffee robot thing we did on Wednesday, but now it's actual really real data <laughs> rather than synthetic data. Uh, but the model has the same structure, same idea. We end up with um, two scale variables, uh, the sigmas that tell us the variation um, in intercepts and slopes across departments, and then a correlation matrix, which in this case is just a two by two correlation matrix, so it has exactly one correlation inside of it. Yeah, because the two by two correlation matrix has got ones on the diagonal, and then on the off diagonals it's got correlations, so there's only one off diagonal cell here to worry about. So it's a correlation between uh, alpha and beta um, across departments, right? There's some average correlation across departments. I'll show you that correlation later because we're going to get to infer it. We'll get a posterior distribution for it. And then uh, ye olde fixed priors at the bottom, right? Uh, down towards the bottom. Uh, and these are chosen to be weakly regularizing, um, as always. Does this make sense? This is just review, right? You, you've seen this model before, but now it's real data. Yeah? And so this is what varying slopes models look like. Uh, they always look like this. The thing that's usually different about them is the top two lines. The top two lines change and you get different models and then a lot of the stuff at the bottom is basically the same. Um, so the code, and if you're going to fit this with map to stand, uh, it, it, you can probably guess what it's going to look like. Um, and it looks like our previous examples here. Uh, we're bracketing on department ID and that instructs the code to make a vector of parameters with the same length as the number of unique departments it finds. And then we uh, get this vector um, for the intercept for each department and its slope. And those are also indexed by department ID. And then there's our uh, DMV norm 2 is just a form of multivariate normal, which takes a, a vector of sigmas and then a correlation matrix, because we want to have them be separate parameters in the model, because we want to specify priors on them separately. It's just what we did before on Wednesday. Uh, run this model. 
uh, it samples uh, very smoothly. And uh, now what we're going to look at on the left, this is the posterior distribution of the correlation uh, between uh, the intercepts and slopes. Yeah? And so uh, it's, since it's a correlation on the horizontal axis, the possible values are between minus 1 and 1. A correlation of 0 means on average no association. When you learn a department's intercept, uh, you learn nothing about the slope, right? That would be 0. Uh, if it's very negative, uh, when you learn a department's intercept, you should expect that, well, if the intercept's high, then the slope will be low, and vice versa, yeah? Um, in this case, there's a lot of evidence that it's negative, but we don't know how negative. <laughs> could be very negative, could be mildly negative. Actually, it could be slightly positive, right? There's not a ton of information about the correlation among departments in these data. And I put the question to you, why? Da, 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 da. No? <laughs> Jeopardy? Is that, is that show still on the air? <laughs> um, uh, so uh, uh, the reason is because there aren't very many departments, right? You've got uh, A, B, C, D, E, and F. Those are all the departments in the data set, and those are the ones you have to uh, interpret the correlation from, right? You think of it that way. Uh, you can precisely estimate the alpha and beta for each of these departments very precisely because there are a lot of applications per department. Your sample size per department is high in these data. But the number of departments is low. So the sample size at the second level, at the clustered level, is small. And that makes it hard to estimate the correlation. Does that make sense? This is very typical uh, with data like this, that you can have power at one level and low power at another. Uh, and that's just how it goes. But of course, since we're doing Bayesian inference, that's fine. Uh, when we have low power, we get the prior back. And that's what we test for. And so we know. But you still get valid inferences. It's not like an asymptotic method where you don't know what to think at all, right? Because the, the estimators are only valid asymptotically. Uh, these estimators are valid at all sample sizes. But you need to check whether the model's learned anything or not, right? And here a lot has been learned. Uh, but still, this is not a very peak posterior distribution. So you shouldn't bet your house on, <laughs> on this being negative. But it's a hint about something, right? Um, Remember, I, I think that maybe this is a point to say something I've, I've said many times in this course, but the business of science is not to have confident predictions. The business of science is to figure out what the data say, right? I'll say that again. The business of science is not to have confident predictions. It's the business of science is to figure out what the data say, conditional on a model, right? Uh, we're not supposed to be soothsayers. When, when you can't make a conclusion, that's our job to report that, right? Does that make sense? Uh, so uh, this is what you report, is the uncertainty. Um, on the right, you can see the scatter plot of the intercepts and slopes for each department done in this shrinkage contour map again. So I'll walk you through this. On the horizontal, the intercept for each department, that's the average log odds that an application from a female identified application is accepted. Sorry, that was <laughs> very awkward grammar. <laughs> but yeah, was that parsable? Did that make sense? Yeah, so uh, uh, zero means 50%, right, 50-50. Um, greater than zero means the majority of applications are accepted. So you see most departments are rejecting most applications from female candidates and male candidates. <laughs> Turns out because there's not much difference, but we'll get to that in a second. Um, there are two departments, A and B, which accept a majority of applications. Yeah? A and B, I think, are physics and engineering, it turns out. They've been anonymized in the data set, but I looked it up. <laughs> you, can find, you can find these things out in the original publications. And um, so, uh, and then all the others are different. And F is like awful, right? So it's almost minus three, uh, which is only like 10% or something, a little less than 10% acceptance rate, something like that. It's a really low. Uh, and I, I think that social psychology or communication, one of the two, it's, it's very tough uh, to get admission. Um, so, uh, and then on the vertical is the slope. This is the difference between uh, a male and female application. If it's above zero, that means an advantage to male applications. If it's below zero, um, uh, disadvantage. You'll see that uh, there are two departments which are a little bit above zero, uh, C and E, right? You see that? Sorry, zero is not labeled. I, I should have redrawn that axis so that zero was labeled on the axis. I apologize. Um, uh, but it's between 0.2 and minus 0.2, right? R has the worst defaults. It's like zero is special. 
<laughs> right? Uh, you can redraw the axis. You can do it. It's just I should have noticed and done something about it. Um, and then uh, the other four departments have negative ones, uh, three of them very slightly. And there's this one very special department, Department A, which has a, a radical uh, disadvantage to male applications. So this is where there's variance in the slopes. And this is what you're seeing here. It isn't the same. The effect of uh, an application being identified as male is not the same in all places. Let's just say the effect, the description of what happens to the chances. We don't know about the causal effects here, right? Because this could be because different kinds of guys apply to Department A than others, right? It doesn't have to be, it's not necessarily evidence that there's discrimination against dudes <laughs> in this, right? It's California, so there's, it's dudes, technically, is the legal term. <laughs> right. In fact, actually, I, uh, I remember when I taught in California, uh, dude is gender neutral uh, for lots of young people in California. It's just oh, yeah. dude. Girlfriends refer to one another as dude uh, all the time. And uh, it, it's fun. So the international audience watching these videos, uh, keep that in mind. Dude is gender neutral in California. It's, it's fun. Um, does this make sense, the way this graph is drawn and what's going on? And the varying slopes are being picked up here? Yeah, so uh, this is a nice thing about uh, varying slopes is that you can consider uh, these possible different associations between predictors in different clusters. And this gives you hints about how to investigate what's really going on, right? It gives you causal leverage, inferential leverage, to figure out what's happening. Um, so you can look at these estimates uh, in this uh, forest plot. Maybe it's a little easier to, to figure out. Um, the slopes for the, first, for the six departments at the top here, you'll see most of them are uh, overlap near zero and overlap it a good amount. Not much evidence that it makes much difference. Yeah. If it does make a difference, it's not a big difference. Uh, but one of these departments, Department A, that is pretty good evidence. This could be spurious. It's just one year of admissions data. If you're going to really do a study on this, right, you should get a decade or more and see what's going on. But uh, uh, in this one year, that's pretty good evidence that there's something going on um, in that particular department. And that gives you something to, to look at. Uh, lots of evidence of variation in the average rates of admission. And that's another, there's another causal story there. That's something to investigate. The identities of the departments tell you something about what's, what's happening uh, in these things. Uh, basically, the, the departments down here with the low values get way more applications. So they reject more. And that's what's happening. And the, the story, which we heard before, of course, is that um, at least in the 1970s, women predominantly applied to those departments. And so their aggregate chances of admission to graduate school were lower as a consequence of that. Yeah. That's the Simpsons paradox that we talked about before. Uh, this happens with, uh, as I said in a previous lecture, that there's some evidence that this happens in a milder form with grant applications for senior people. Right? It's way harder to get funding in social psychology uh, than it is in physics. And uh, that, that disproportionately affects the genders uh, because of the way the genders are just gender is distributed. Is that, is that grammatical? Uh, uh, in the sciences, right? So it's, there's a lot of interesting sociology uh, to plumb out of this. Um, but back to statistics, the boring part. Uh, <laughs> let's move on to an example that adds another layer to this. Um, same type of model now, uh, but let, let me show you the most complicated model in the course. Uh, I think. This is the most complicated model in the course, and it's still pretty simple because it just builds all the tools you've already seen and puts them together in the same model in a logical way. Uh, this is, we're going to go back to the chimpanzee experimental data before. Uh, I won't re-explain it, apologies. Uh, so if you're joining me now, uh, you'll have to go back and read chapter 10. Um, uh, remind you, uh, our goal though is we've got two kinds of clusters. We've got actors, which are individual chimpanzees, and we've got experimental blocks. We should cluster on both of those things because there are repeat observations in both. And this generates uh, what's, what's called a cross-classified model. And now we want to do that with our slopes as well. Right? We want to allow uh, the effects of treatment to vary by individual and by block. Right? Imagine on some particular day, the treatment didn't work at all. Uh, because of the time it was done, the chimpanzees had all just eaten. Something like that. Right? It could happen. I've seen experiments go awry for exactly reasons like this, right? If all the chimpanzees had just had a bucket of carrots, then you try to get them to do something for a grape, it might not work. <laughs> and so you, that's a block effect, right? Uh, but then there can be individual effects. Some chimpanzees just don't care, <laughs> and, right? Uh, just give me the grape already, <laughs> right? That's how it's going to work. So there could be uh, 
uh, varying slopes on actors and it could be varying slopes on blocks. And the way we consider that possibility is, of course, by putting varying slopes on everything. <laughs> Absolutely everything. Let me show you how to do that. It's just a, a logical extension of what you've already done. Um, so here's the model we're going to build. Uh, let me explain this piece by piece. Um, so this looks complicated, but this is just the linear model part. And I've just broken it up so that you can see how these things get constructed. Uh, the top is the likelihood. The outcome is pulling the left-hand lever. Um, we have a logit. We're going to model everything on log odds because it's a logistic regression. First, there's an intercept for uh, pull i. And the intercept for pull i is a function of a bunch of stuff. Um, it, it's the, it, it's a, a grand mean alpha, and then offsets for actor and block. Yeah? This is just the varying intercept model we did last week. Yes? Yeah, OK, there's a nodding. Thank you. Uh, and uh, now the new part is we're also going to have varying slopes. Now, the um, effect of the partner being present, that's what uh, this beta sub p is, was the partner present. Was there another chimpanzee at the end of this, t uh, the, uh, at, uh, was there a chimpanzee at the other end of the table who could receive uh, the other piece of food or not? Right, this is a, an important thing. Um, is this right? Uh, uh, I forget which is coded as which. Anyway, there's a slope. <laughs> and uh, B sub P, there's a mean effect, beta sub P, and then there are offsets for actor and block. So this is how the random slope gets composed. But that sum is then the thing that appears in the linear model as a regular old slope, right? It's like the, the, the slope gets adjusted by offsets that are specific to each actor and block. Um, and then finally, the interaction effect. Uh, with condition, um, yeah, P is prosocial. Sorry, I misspoke. P is prosocial whether there are two pieces of food on the left, and and C is whether there's is the condition whether there's a partner or not. So the interaction, um, uh, this bonus when it's on the left is prosocial and there's a partner present, uh, is again same idea. There's an average effect B sub P. Or, sorry, that should be a C. So I should proofread this slide. Uh, it should be. A PC, sorry, and then offsets for actor and block. Typos aside, does this make sense? Yeah? The code is correct, I promise you. Uh, and uh, so what you see is in, in all we have three average effects, uh, three actor offsets, and three block offsets. But you can th it's easier to think about it if you split the linear model apart like this, I think. Yeah, does this help? Instead of putting all these symbols in one line, which would be a mess, I assert. Yeah, try it at home. Uh, so um, the tricky part of this is then what do we do with all of these offsets? Well, now there are three effects per cluster type. So we're going to have two separate um, adaptive priors, just like before when we did this is with only intercepts. Remember we had two normal distributions that were adaptive priors that were functions of things? We still got that, but now they're three-dimensional. Why? Because they're three effects. So it's just like the model we just did, but now instead of two by two matrices, we have three by three matrices. There's no limit. You can just keep making them bigger. No problem. Yeah, until your computer runs out of memory. Uh, yeah, or you get bored and retire, <laughs> something like that. Uh, so uh, for each actor, the way you could read this first one on the slide is for each actor, there's an alpha a beta sub p and a beta sub pc for each actor. Those are normally distributed in a three-dimensional normal distribution. Uh, they're zero-centered because we're going to model them as offsets. Yeah? Offsets from the grand mean with a covariance matrix for actors. And that S sub actor is a three by three matrix. Uh, and then the same thing for blocks. For each block, there's an alpha offset a beta sub p offset and a beta sub pc offset. Likewise, this is another, a different multivariate normal distribution with zero means and a different covariance matrix. Yeah? The code looks basically the same. There's just more of it, more delightful code uh, to see here. So uh, at the top part, I've labeled this. You can put comments in these models if you want. Yeah, I do with my own models. Uh, they're replete with comments. In fact, my models start out as a list of comments, and then I fill in code <laughs> between comments. Uh, I, I, I hope the uh, 
I think I made this joke in my department a couple weeks ago. I hope the uh, science archaeologists of the year 3000 are happy that I'm putting in all these comments in my code so that they can figure out what the purpose of this weird ritual activity is that we're doing here. Uh, but uh, my code is just full of comments, uh, so I do encourage it to, to you to do this. Um, when the model gets compiled, the comments just get stripped out, right? So you can put them in as much as you want. Uh, so the top is the likelihood, then the linear models. It's, you can, in math stand, you can do this. You can have as many linear models as you want. Just break them apart. And the, the, so BPC is a symbol that's up in the top one, right? So it's no problem. It just gets substituted. It's, it's all good. Yeah? It's no problem. As uh, many linear models as you like. And then the adaptive priors uh, down here. And uh, you can see it's, it looks messy, but it's the same structure as before. You're creating a vector with the C function. It means collection, I think, in R. And you put in the three effects, an intercept and two slopes, cluster them by actor. And then the D, D, M, V, norm, two line looks the same. Yeah? And then so it's like, how does R know it's three-dimensional now? Well, because there are three effects on the front. So it knows it's a three-dimensional normal distribution and sets it up correctly. Yeah? If you coded this raw yourself in Stan, uh, you'd have to specify that. You'd have to specify it's a 3 by 3 But map to Stan just figures that out, right? It just guesses. It has a primitive, very extremely primitive artificial intelligence that says, oh, you have three effects on the front of this. You must want a three-dimensional normal distribution. That's how smart it is. Uh, you could beat it at chess, right? <laughs> so, and then the fixed priors. Does this make sense? Yeah? It's familiar? And this, this code strategy works no matter how many effects you want to put in there. Uh, uh, the major limit is not the code. It's your it's interpretability. And I'll say that again. The major limit is not what you can do with the code. It's what you can understand. Yeah, that's the barrier. Uh, but in principle, with, these, with a sampler like Stan that uses Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, um, you can be very unrestrained with how many things you let be random. That's not a problem. Yeah? Okay. All right, so uh, what do we get? Uh, in total, in that model, there are 54 parameters. Let me count them for you. Right? These are like the days of Christmas. Does anybody know that song? Right? Uh, three French hens. <laughs> we have three French hens. No, three average effects. Right? Uh, three times seven equals 21 varying effects on actor. Why is it three times seven? There are seven actors, and there are three effects per actor. So 21 actor-specific parameters. Yeah? Um, 3 times 6 is 18 varying effects on block. Same idea. There are 3 effects per block and 6 blocks. So you can see right away, in a big data set, you, count up, you, you ramp up parameters very fast. Right? So imagine you had a substantially large sample, like 200 individuals, and there are 3 effects per individual. This is, this is an ordinary sort of situation in the sciences. Yeah, not a problem at all. It's not even a very big data set. Uh, then you've got, suddenly, 600 effects on individuals. No problem. Stan will do it. Um, I just finished up, well, just finished up a couple months ago, I finished up models on a project where we have 27,000 parameters. Uh, there are about, I don't know, I forget how many individuals, like 8,000 individuals, something like that, and then a bunch of random effects, um, and it samples fine. So it's, you're sampling from a 27,000 dimensional surface. Yeah? Your computer can do it. Uh, it can handle it. So uh, this model's no sweat, right? So, uh, six standard deviations and six free correlation parameters. So the, if, if you're classically trained or you've had a standard statistics education, which is fine. I mean, it's, it's, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> I don't mean to put it, have any implication there is. It's just the only thing that's wrong with it is you get the wrong intuitions about these models sometimes. And I think my experience is one of the mistaken intuitions is, oh, my God, there's 54 parameters. You're going to overfit. No, the parameter count doesn't tell you your overfitting risk. It doesn't because we have priors. And in a hierarchical model, the priors are learned from the data. It's adaptive. And so if there's not much variation on a cluster, the parameters that are specific to that cluster type have almost no effect at all on the fit. Yeah? Does it make sense? Because of the regularization. If the sigma ends up being estimated to be small, those estimates will be shrunk towards zero very aggressively. Uh, and the model will be very skeptical that there's anything. And this is what's going to happen with block here. You're going to see in a second is that there's no action at the block level. You saw that before, because it was a good experiment, <laughs> right? And, well, at least in that respect. I won't judge it until, I actually think it is a good experiment, but I can't, <laughs> I'm only talking about the block effects, right? So, um, 
you can get a hint of this. If you fit this model and you look at WAIC, the effective number of parameters according to WAIC in this case is 18. Uh, and then the question is, that's a lot less than 54. <laughs> yeah, and the question is why? And the reason is, when you look at the sigma estimates, all but one of them is very small. So sigma actor one, which is the, so now there are indices, sigma actor one is the intercepts on actor. It's the first effect in that vector of effects specific to actor. Yeah, does that make sense? Why it's the number one? Um, and it's substantial. Well, we saw that before because there are tremendous handedness preferences among the individuals in this study. And that explains most of the variation in, in the experiment. Not all of it, because there are experimental effects in here, but that's most of the variation. Uh, but then none of the other sigmas are very uh, big above zero at all. Um, so their their 89% intervals are from zero to some number. Basically, you get the prior back uh, with these things. Well, it's, there's some learning from it, but uh, they, in fact, shrinks towards zero. So you do learn it's more than the prior. The prior is very dispersed. Um, there's not much action at uh, uh, either at any of the block effects uh, or at the slope variation. Not much evidence that individuals differ in their response to the treatments uh, or that block has much effect at all. And this is why the effective number of parameters is so much smaller than the actual parameter count. Because those sigmas are small, that means the prior is, has a very small standard deviation and that aggressively regularizes the parameter effects uh, estimates towards zero. Yeah? This just builds on, this is pooling, right? Remember pooling? Shrinkage. There's a lot of shrinkage going on in this model. And so uh, you can fit the model where you drop all these effects and you get basically the same estimate. Uh, because that's what adaptive regularization is going to do for you. It's going to give you good estimates even for complex models. That's the idea. It's the whole principle uh, behind it. It's, it's tuning uh, these things. So um, uh, I've got time. So I put in this as optional, but it, since I'm doing well on time here, uh, uh, let me talk to you about it. So there is a very common um, technical issue with fitting uh, multi-level models, especially those that um, have you know, complicated covariance structures to them, uh, is that there are different ways to specify exactly the same model in the code. So the mathematical definition of the model it would be identical, because math don't care. Uh, but when you, the way you write the code makes a difference for how efficiently it samples. And by, by that I mean how long you need to sit there and wait, or how, how many coffees you need to drink downstairs before your computer finishes or whatever. Now, how much your office overheats in the summer, right? In my department, we have servers in the basement within the cooling towers, right, so that we don't overheat our offices. But this may not be a luxury, I understand, for everybody. And then you will kill your plants in your office from the heat, the exhaust heat from your computer, right? I mean, you, this is a time that sometimes with grad students, they learn that their computer has a fan, right? <laughs> so they start running these models, and there's suddenly this noise your computer's making for the first time ever, because it has a fan that it's never turned on before. Yeah, so um, how long does that process have to go on? And uh, it makes a difference. So let me introduce you to this. This is a thing called the non-centered form of a hierarchical model. Uh, and this is, there's, this is a huge topic in the literature. This is actually a really common thing. And um, so the, the in map to stand, there's this convenience that the flip between the so-called centered, which is what you did before, and non-centered, you just use a different multivariate normal uh, distribution. D, M, V, norm, N, C is the so-called non-centered version. Uh, there's a section in chapter 13 of my book about this. Um, what does non-centered mean? Non-centered means you factor all the parameters out of the prior. I'll say that again. Non-centered means you factor all the parameters out of the prior. So where do they go? They go in the linear model. Uh, so let me, let me try to explain what's going on. Well, okay, first, why do you want to do this? Then I'll explain what it is. You want to do this because you get radically different efficiencies. So this is that same chimpanzee model with all the random effects, right? We got three on actor, three on block. So two three by three covariance matrices. Um, this is the, the, the centered version, the first version I showed you, where there are, you put the sigmas, the covariance matrix is in the adaptive prior down there. When you see it in the model, it's down in the adaptive prior. Um, uh, we're looking at the effective number of samples for the different parameters in the model uh, from that. Just running, running the model for, I forget how long, way too long, way more than you need. 
and it's around 2,000 on average. Then I use the non-centered version and we get way, way more higher effective samples. Uh, which means in principle you don't have to run, if you use the non-centered version of this model, you don't have to run it very long. Uh, remember the effective number of samples is what you're interested in, not the actual number of samples. Um, so why does this arise? Uh, well that's a complicated topic that I will not actually attempt to explain today because it has to do with geometry and things like that. But um, the, the simple version of it is to say, uh, and you can think of this, I apologize, as magic, is that uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo works best when every dimension in the posterior is approximately a unit normal. <laughs> that would be great. If you could get everything to be unit normal. So this is a big Gaussian hypersphere with standard deviation one in every direction. Boy, then sampling would be super smooth. That would be great. That's ideal. That's the best thing. And so it turns out by factoring, refactoring your priors, you can approach this goal. You can never get there, but you can, act, but you can approach it. Yeah? It's like enlightenment. You never arrive. Uh, you're just trying to get a little closer in this lifetime. <laughs> right? Uh, so uh, here's the trick that, that makes this legal uh, for lots of distributions. This works, I'm going to show you only for normals, but this works for lots of distributions. You can factor things out of them. Uh, and so think about um, a normal distribution. Y is distributed normally with uh, mean, mu, and sigma. You, you probably know that in lots of stats textbooks, not mine, but in lots of stats textbooks, this will be written this way. Y equals mu plus um, something z times sigma, where z is distributed as a normal 0, 1. The z's are yz because it's a z score, right? A standardized Gaussian residual. And these are equivalent statements. These are mathematically equivalent. Exactly the same. It's just that in this version, we've taken the mean and put it in the linear model. Right? So now y is some average plus an offset, which is some scale parameter sigma, which is the standard deviation, times the z-score specific to that y value. They're exactly the same information. Yeah? You with me? I know, this is like horror. This is not why you got into science. It's not why I got into science either, but this is, this is the science minds now. You get out your mathematical pickaxe and you factor. <laughs> and there's gold in those hills, and uh, we will learn things from this. Yes, this metaphor is not working, is it? <laughs> All right, I'll try another later. <laughs> but uh, uh, so, uh, in our case, uh, we're thinking of the cases where, say, varying intercepts is the simplest way to think about this. The centered form, the way you'd write the models, mu is some actor-specific intercept plus stuff. Stuff is your predictors and your slopes. And, other, other stuff, right? So stuff, technical term. And uh, then you have um, a, the kind of prior I showed you before. This is called a centered prior because the A and the sigma are in the prior. Right? It centers the prior. It locates it. It puts the scale on it in that line. Uh, then the non-centered form, which is perfectly equivalent mathematically, looks like this. Now we take that A and we put it in the linear model. Yeah? You've already done this part, right? Uh, then we have a z sub actor, now a z score to each actor, cluster on that actor, times sigma, plus your same stuff. The stuff is the same. And now your prior is z actor, cluster on actor is normal 0, 1. All of the parameters have come out of the prior, but these are the same model. Isn't math great? Don't you love it? Yeah, no. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Page 408 of my book has a lot about this, uh, and 408 and 409 go on about this, because this is actually routinely useful in fitting these models. And each of these forms uh, is useful in different data sets because of, well, again, it's, think of this as magic, geometry. <laughs> because of the details of the sample sizes at the different levels, um, uh, sometimes the centered version is better, sometimes the non-centered form is better. Um, the UC Berkeley, uh, data set, for example, the centered form samples better. For the chimpanzee data, the non-centered form samples better. Uh, so you need to know both. Um, map to stand makes it easy to flip between them, but it's nice to know that these exist because it will save you some time and give you more reliable samples. Um, okay, so uh, very quickly then the last thing to say about this, uh, what I just showed you Okay, you can probably see how you can factor the, the mean and the standard deviation out of a normal, because that's, that's standardization. You do this with variables all the time, right? If you just had a column of values and I told you to standardize it, what would you do? 
well, I hope what you would do uh, <laughs> is you would calculate the mean, and then you subtract it from every value. Now the mean of the column is zero, yeah? So that's when we take alpha out of the prior. That's all we've done. Now we've made the mean of the prior zero. No information has been lost. We just smuggled that mean into the linear model. And then you should calculate the standard deviation of those mean-centered values, and you should divide each value by that standard deviation. Now the standard deviation of the column is 1. But we've got to put the scale back on it to make predictions. And so where does the scale go? It goes in the linear model. <laughs> right? It's got to go back up there in the linear model. The linear model then has got to give you a z-score, and then you multiply that z-score by the standard deviation to get back on the original scale. Right? So if you divide to standardize, you must multiply at the end to get back on the original scale. Yeah? It's just the inverse operation. Does this make some sense? Hopefully my hand gestures are helping you understand. Invert the operation. Sorry. <laughs> my family makes endless fun of me for the way I talk with like this all the time. So, uh, all right. Uh, so what, but it's probably not easy to see how you can take this uh, strategy and extend it to a covariance matrix. Now, how do you factor a covariance matrix out and put it in a linear model? That's a good question. I'm glad you asked. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, the answer is we appeal to Mansur Koleski. And uh, uh, Mansur Koleski was an officer in the French army in World War I. Uh, unfortunately, he died in a battle just before the end of World War I. He was a very accomplished mathematician. Um, and specialized in geodesy, uh, the study of how to measure the Earth. And he invented, uh, he, was, he was working on artillery, so you know, a lot of good useful math comes from monstrous things, but uh, he was working on artillery, and he invented a, a method for factoring matrices that is fast and incredibly useful. And it's called the Koleski decomposition. Uh, by the way, it's a Polish name, but he was French. He was recent. His parents were Polish, I think, or his grandparents, and they immigrated to France. That's why you get the... The history is actually really uh, quite interesting about these things. So, um, uh, so uh, posthumously, uh, a colleague of his posthumously published his method. And uh, it has since become extremely useful in applied mathematics. And uh, it is used to fit linear regressions and all kinds of things now because it's an extremely useful and efficient way to factor matrices. Uh, and it turns out there's this wonderful fact um, that if you take the covariance matrix and compute its, what's called its Koleski factor, you can then multiply a vector of z-scores, uncorrelated z-scores, by the Koleski factor, and then they'll have any correlation structure you like. Uh, it's a way of, of compartmentalizing, uh, summarizing the covariance structure in something uh, to generate correlated sequences of random, ve random variables. Uh, and that's how you use it. So again, uh, uh, on page 409, uh, I give you some citations to this. Um, uh, since I'm doing okay on time here, uh, here's the simplest example in two dimensions of what, a, what happens from this. The Koleski factor gives you factors, terms, that you want to multiply the different uncorrelated variables by to give them a correlation structure. So in the two-dimensional case, this is what it would look like. So at the top of this R code, I'm going to generate, um, what is that, 10,000? Uh, 10 to the fourth? <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, values, um, it's, we're going to have a bivariate normal distribution where the first dimension has standard deviation 2, the second dimension has a standard deviation of a half, and they're correlated 0.6. This is what I want. But I'm going to start by generating totally uncorrelated z-scores. So z1 is r norm, 10,000 random normals with mean 0, standard deviation 1. Z2 is 10,000 random normals with mean 0 standard deviation 1. You can probably see why they're uncorrelated, right? Because they're just different lines of code. Uh, here's the Koleski magic now. If you calculate the Koleski factor um, for the, the covariance matrix implied by those two sigmas in that row up there, it tells you that the operations you need to do to construct now two new sequences of random variables, A1 and A2, that have those standard deviations and the, exactly that correlation on average, this is what you should do. You should take the first one and multiply it by its sigma. That probably makes sense to you, right? So that puts it on the right scale. Uh, and then the second one is the fun, and there's all this stuff, and that's what the Koleski factor gives you, is this stuff in the middle here. Um, it's rho times the first z-score plus the square root of 1 minus rho squared times e2. Yeah, it's obvious, right? Now, anyway, this is what comes out of the Koleski factor. It just it comes out of it. So in higher dimensions, you get more of these fun square root and squares and, and things. Uh, but you get the answer, and then you just literally just 
plug it in, and there's a simple matrix algebra formula for inducing the correlation. Um, and that's how it works. So give thanks uh, tonight uh, to uh, Mansur Koleski. Uh, <laughs> he has done us a great service uh, <laughs> in this. There are other ways to do this. It's just this is the best. Um, yeah? So I have a blog post about this if you want to read even more about it, about the wonders of algebra and different forms of multi-level models. Um, as I say, this is, it seems like an ex exotic thing, but it's not. This is a routine thing that helps you stay sane when you're fitting multi-level models. The members of my department know this, right? This is a standard thing. I know John, in particular, has had lots of fun uh, with, both with Koleski factors. Yes. Uh, so, uh, now, um, I think it'd be useful, uh, before going on to Gaussian processes, uh, to say a, a little bit about uh, part of the applied statistician's challenge is that people come to us wanting very specific advice, but we usually don't know enough about their science to give them very specific advice. And so I always call this the horoscopic advice problem, is that people come and they say, so I've got these data, what should I do? And I, I, I don't know. And why do I call it horoscopic? It's because it, I don't have enough information. Um, to be fully useful. It's like doing horoscopes, right? If all I knew was your birth date, uh, then I'm supposed to forecast your life, <laughs> right? That's how it often feels when I do statistics consulting, is that people come and they tell me a few things, like, I've got a couple variables, what should I do? And it's like, well, I don't know. Um, it's considered investing, uh, <laughs> right? It, it's tough. Uh, but I do think there is some general advice that's useful. And so I, I, I've tried to put... Um, the advice that's specific to multi-level models down on a slide. And uh, uh, a lot of this advice is embedded in the way I've given you guys homework problems, in fact, to try and teach you some of these lessons. So, for example, um, just quickly go over this. Begin, it's useful to begin with the empty model that has none of the predictors, but has the clustering structure that comes from where there are repeat observations in your data, right? This, this is two reasons to do this. First, it helps you stay sane. In, in complicated models, you don't want to build it all at once because you'll make a mistake. And then it'll be very hard to figure out exactly which piece of it's wrong, right? Because those of you who know who use R or any other statistical software know the error messages are not always so helpful, <laughs> right? All you know is that something has gone wrong, but you don't know what. Uh, so you want to build these models in pieces, in little bits. And so get the clustering structure first and make sure that works. The second reason is that that tells you where the action is. It tells you which cluster has the most variation. And that's useful uh, as well. And then like with that homework problem I gave you, right, with the tadpoles, you watch the variance shrink. And that you learn stuff from that. This is where model comparison teaches you things about the data set. Um, just for the sake of getting things to predict well, I uh, mean fit well, you want to standardize all your predictors before you run the model. You don't want predictors to have, have values like 400 on them. Just standardize them so that they all have mean zero and standard deviation one. It makes the computer work better. Because then it doesn't have to figure out the scale of all these things differently. If you put them all in the same scale, the model adaptation is more efficient. That's all. You could get it to fit with these inconvenient scales, but do yourself a favor. <laughs> uh, it's also typically easier to specify reasonable priors once you standardize things, because you can think about a standard deviation change in a predictor. It's easier to, talk, to put the prior on that scale. Use regularizing priors. This makes the model fit better, it, and it prevents impossibly wild uh, overfitting as well. Um, then you start adding in predictors and vary their slopes if they're in clusters, uh, um, and you go. Uh, if you get uh, varying effects that have tiny sigmas, you can drop them. It's harmless. You could also leave them in. Uh, you'll get the same predictions. Yeah? Um, so I tried to show you before. And then uh, look back at the end of Chapter 12 where I talked about the sort of posterior predictions of interest um, is, are your inferences about the specific clusters that were in these data, or there, are they about some generalization to other clusters? So you need to be careful when you inspect the predictions which of these you're concerned with. Okay. And then at the bottom, uh, as always with horoscopes, uh, you may know things that make all of this advice silly. Uh, and that's you're the scientist, you have to drive, right? I'm the backseat statistician. Uh, don't let the statistician drive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let the science drive. Okay, um, last 15 minutes, uh, I want to tell you about Gaussian processes and give you a really simple example of how they work. Uh, so it comes up all the time, and the data on the slide illustrate this, that there are predictor variables which um, 
have big effects in the data. Uh, but their relationship to the outcome is complicated and continuous. So you get repeat observations, but not necessarily at exactly the same values. So uh, I, I'm going to call these continuous categories, which is an oxymoron, right? It's like jumbo shrimp, military intelligence. So that I come from a military family. I'm allowed to make that joke. Uh, right? Both of my parents worked in military intelligence, actually. But so uh, uh, jumbo shrimp, military intelligence, what's another one? Anyway, uh, continuous categories. So the, the point is age. Age is the classic one. Um, nobody has exactly the same age, right? Uh, but your, your age is more similar to other people's. And age, it isn't that age has a causal effect necessarily on something like here, political preferences, but it's a proxy. It's something that helps us make useful predictions because people who were born around the same time have experienced some of the same events. Uh, so, like for my generation of Americans, uh, the fall of, fall of the Berlin Wall. A, this was a memorable time. And also for people that were out here, right, if you're of a certain age. And that has had lasting effects on political ideology uh, for people's whole lifetimes. So, uh, but it isn't, you can't cluster people by age because the ages are unique in your data. If you, you know, you could round them and then say, but still you're going to have then you have a hundred different unique ages or something like that, and you, don't want to, and you don't want to uniquely cluster on all those. Well, you could. That'd probably work fine. But then you're throwing away the information that ages closer to one another are more similar in prior expectation. Right? Someone who was born a year before me and a year after me should, in prior expectation, before we see their voting record, uh, be more similar to me in, in political ideology than someone born 20 years after me. Yeah? That's the prior expectation. So we want to put that information in the prior somehow. And so Gaussian processes, is a, it's, it's a technique, it's not the only technique, but it's a very useful machine learning technique for taking the, the partial pooling strategy uh, to variables of this type. And again, you want to do it because it helps you regularize. You, you'll have massive imbalance across age and all kinds of other things, and so you want to regularize appropriately dealing with that imbalance. It's the same sort of issue. Yeah, so you can do better using this. Um, and what these uh, methods do is they estimate functions that relate age to the outcome. And they do it with the partial pooling. Uh, they're super cool. I uh, love these things. And so here's an example from uh, Andrew Gelman and his colleagues where they look at the example I gave, my generation, the so-called Reagan generation, <laughs> uh, people born around 1970. And uh, American born around 1970, Carl knows this, <laughs> special, special group. Right? And uh, we're, we're a lot more conservative uh, on average than other cohorts. Age adjusted. Now, we all get more conservative, at least all Americans do. I don't know in general if it's true, but Americans get more conservative as they age. I don't know what it is. <laughs> Calcification or something like that. I don't know. But uh, uh, it's an effect. I think it is, uh, there's a global tendency towards this, actually. It's probably accumulation of stuff that you don't want to be taxed. I don't know. I should stop talking before someone sends me hangry mail. But, <laughs> um, and uh, so uh, regardless, what, this is what we're looking at on the left. Um, if you look at birth year around 1970, and then these different colored curves are different elections, American presidential elections. And you're looking at offsets, uh, uh, proportions of the Republican vote in those years by birth year. And this is raw empirical, uh, what you're seeing. This is not an S. This is the raw uh, uh, voting data. And so you'll see, even though there are big shocks in different elections that move the curves up and down, you can also see that when you line things up by birth year, there are persistent cohort effects of birth year. Yeah? And it's not the year you're born in that matters. Uh, and this is what the rest of this paper is about. It's when you're approaching voting age, what's going on? <laughs> That's the thing. Who's in office, and the, the thing that they find, if I remember the paper right, is which party controls the presidency and how popular are they? Uh, and those are, the interaction of those two things has a big effect. And so there, it seems to be that there's this sensitive window for the acquisition of political ideology. Uh, and so the Reagan generation, there was this big boom towards republicanism because, you know, Reagan, <laughs> wall, <laughs> stuff like that. Uh, and then the generations after that, there was a big hit to republicanism. And so the, the Obama cohort, for example, the forecast from this is that there will be a very persistent, the people who, who are nearing voting age or just reached voting age during the first Obama election are, will be uh, strongly oriented towards the Democratic Party for the rest of their lives. That's the prediction, and we'll be able to test that as time goes on. Yeah? But this, this is the idea of the causal effect. I think this is fascinating. 
maybe you find political science boring, but uh, I think this is really interesting. Um, I'm sure if we looked in Germany, we could find really fascinating effects like this. Of course, here you've got way more parties, so it gets hard. But, um, uh, but I bet you could find effects. Anyway, this is, a Gauss, this is something a Gaussian process can really help us with. Uh, so uh, oh, this is the summary slide of what I just explained to you. So age is an example I said. Also income, yeah, individuals with similar incomes may have similar incentives in lots of ways, but it's not, it's not a discrete category. It's a continuous measure. Um, what's a function that would let us relate income to some behavioral outcome? Uh, your location, where you live, right? Again, we're using location. It's not causal itself. It's a proxy for a bunch of unmeasured stuff. But this is always what clusters are. It isn't that the ID number of a chimpanzee is causal. It's that it's a proxy for the personality of that individual, which we haven't measured directly. Yeah? Um, phylogenetic distance, uh, uh, network distance, many other things have this nature. They're continuous measures. Um, and in... in Entities close to one another should be more similar in prior expectation. So the clustering shouldn't be discrete uh, in the prior. You could do it that way. It won't wreck things. The inferences would be okay. But the argument is we could do better when we exploit the prior expectation that more similar values are more similar. Okay. So Gaussian process is a way to do that. Let's return to a previous data example, as always, uh, to understand how this works. Remember the Oceanic Tools data set? This is, I introduced Poisson regression with this. Uh, we're going to predict the historical uh, complexity of the toolkit in different oceanic societies and as a function of population size and contact between the islands. Uh, one of the uh, potential confounds in data like this is space. Some islands are closer to others. And tools move. Why? Because people carry them. And so some small societies might have more tools because they live close to big societies. And in fact, I think that's probably true. And so the question is, when we account for the spatial, this is called spatial autocorrelation sometimes, when we account for the spatial autocorrelation, is there still an effect of population size? And so let's see how to put that in. And again, you can't cluster discreetly on location because every island is at a unique place, right? <laughs> Your clusters would have membership one in every case, yeah? Uh, so Gaussian processes are natural uh, for this. There are other ways to do this, but this is a really nice way to do it that handles the regularization. Um, so what we need to make this work is a distance matrix here. So that's what I'm showing you. I have built this into the package so that you don't have to compute it yourself. But I made these data. Well, how? By going to a website that gave me the distances between islands. Uh, that's exactly how I got it. Now, this is, in, these aren't, this is as the crow flies. Uh, but Polynesian voyagers were not crows. right? <laughs> so the, these are not necessarily the most relevant distances. We could do better. Uh, is to say, uh, what would you want? You'd want travel distances, and the travel distances will depend upon trade winds and other things that are, we can figure this out. If, if I were actually a scholar of Oceania, I would be able to do this, but I'm not. So I just used a website that gave me as the crow flies, great circles on the globe, right? It's not a straight line because that would take you through the earth. Uh, they, were, they were great circle distances, at least. So it's not the worst I could do. It's just <laughs> second worst, <laughs> right? Um, and then uh, You've just got pairs of uh, societies in here. The diagonal is all zero because you're distance zero from yourself. Yeah, you can quote me on that. And, uh, and then pairs of islands have particular, uh, these are distances in thousands of kilometers. You with me? So with ages, it's the same thing. Uh, you do distance in age uh, between any two people. Uh, you can do it that way. OK, so what's the model look like? It looks like a varying intercept model. We've got a Poisson outcome up top. Um, Poisson models conventionally use a log link. That's what I'll use here. So on the log number of the log average number of tools for a society comes from a linear model where there's some average number of tools, uh, and then there's an island offset. I'm going to call this gamma now, but it's just like a random intercept, right? It enters the linear model exactly like a random intercept. We have a random intercept for each island, and then there's the effect of log population on the end. It's a standard fixed regression effect. Yeah, you with me? So all the action in the Gaussian process comes from how you specify gamma. And so uh, this is called the Gaussian process prior. It's still a multivariate normal. The gammas are, are in a single multivariate normal distribution. And the dimension of this distribution is the number of unique entities in your data set, which in this case is the number of islands. 
which is how many? Uh, let me go back. Um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Right, so this is a 10 by 10 multivariate normal distribution. Yeah? Uh, sorry, here. <laughs> this is a 10 by 10 normal, multivariate normal distribution. Means are all zeros because we're going to do these as offsets. Right, the average is taken care of in the linear model. These are offsets. And then there's a covariance matrix K, which is a 10 by 10 covariance matrix. Uh, this is what we're modeling. We're modeling this covariance matrix now. And there are going to, this covariance matrix, uh, hang on to your hats, is um, specified by a very small number of parameters. So even though it's 10 by 10, and I just conditioned you to the idea that, oh my God, there's going to be so many parameters in that thing. No, because we're going we're gonna to calculate this from a formula. And that's what the Gaussian process does, is you, you find the function that gives you this covariance matrix that explains the data well, given the regularization. So each entry ij, i and j are islands. Uh, the covariance between those two islands is modeled as some maximum covariance, eta squared, times this stuff, uh, where e to the minus rho squared d squared uh, ij. d squared ij is the squared distance between the two islands. Uh, this is a Gaussian function. I'm going to plot it on the next slide, so hang on. Uh, this is just to show you the math. And rho squared is a parameter that determines how quickly the covariance declines as the distance increases. If it's a big number, then uh, distance doesn't have much of an effect. Right? It has very little effect at all. Or, or proximity has very little effect at all. Put it that way. Yeah? Dominique, is that a question? Or is thought? Okay. You'll find when you guys are teachers that every, every minor gesture from a student is, is something you attend to. Uh, it's, it's like a pathology. Uh, so, and then this last term is if you've got repeat observations for the same entities, you want to let those vary, and that's what the sigma squared is. It's the residual variation within each unique island. In this case, we only have one measure for each island, so sigma squared doesn't matter. But in general, it'll give you that residual error. Okay. So, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I always have these slides where I have all the words on it, uh, and then I forget I have them. So, this is what I just said. <laughs> um, all right, let's plot it. Uh, so, all the action comes from that e to the minus rho squared d squared. That's a Gaussian. Uh, remember, a, a Gaussian distribution is just an exponentiated parabola. I know, that, it's like, well, thanks, that helped Richard, right? <laughs> but, uh, no, it is, so... Yeah. If your brain works like mine, that's like, well, what, what else could you ask for? That's perfectly clear. <laughs> but no, it, so all that means e to the minus of some squared measure of the data gives you a bell curve. Uh, that's where bell curves come from. And that's the Gaussian distribution. That's what it is. All the other junk in the Gaussian uh, probability density is just normalization. It just makes sure that it sums to one. Uh, that's all it does. But the shape is exponentiating uh, this, this minus squared thing. And uh, so... Uh, to show you what that means, how we're modeling, is uh, on the horizontal axis here we've got the distance between any two given islands. And what we're going to do is find a function uh, represented by this, uh, that has a shape as, as represented by this solid curve here, um, uh, that where the correlation between those islands falls off as the distance increases. And what we're going to model is the rate at which it falls off. Yeah? And that's what the term in brackets does. Eta squared just translates this correlation into a covariance, right? But it gives you the maximum, maximum correlation, so to speak, between the two. Yeah? The maximum obvious correlation is obviously one. But the typical, how correlated are islands that are really close to one another, it may not be one, right? So this curve can be shrunk down. But I'm just showing you the term in, in, the, in the rectangle up there. Uh, if you take the square out from the D, then you get the dashed line. It's linear. And you can do that, too. Uh, that's fine. It's just a different assumption. Yeah, but the, the squared one um, yeah, tends to be much easier to fit. And the consequence of it is that uh, there's very little decline in covariance for very small distances, but then it accelerates as you move away. Okay? As opposed to the linear one where the decline is maximized at the origin, uh, which is probably not reasonable. <laughs> uh, that's my hunch about it. You with me? So uh, to really understand this, you guys are going to have to sit down with your console and do the calculation. This is the full model. Uh, I encourage you, to, encourage you to go home and sit down with a cup of coffee and uh, run this. This sample's in no time at all. Don't be afraid. Uh, it runs really nice. And the model uh, code doesn't look particularly uh, more complicated than anything you've done before either. 
Um, why? Because I wrote a function GPL2, which does all the hard part for you. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. Uh, and uh, then the model output looks like a varying intercepts model, and you process it like a varying intercepts model. The posterior distribution comes out to you just like any kind of typical thing. And so now for each island, we've got an offset. But those, those intercepts have been regularized given this covariance function, which has been inferred. Um, uh, what does that uh, covariance function look like? Well, we can draw covariance functions from the posterior distribution. That's what I'm showing you on this slide. Uh, the, again, distance in thousands of kilometers on the horizontal. And then the covariance between those islands at that distance, the expected covariance. Um, on the vertical, and each of these lines is a sample from the posterior distribution, and the solid one, that's the posterior mean. Uh, so there's some effect of distance in these data, almost certainly, right? It's not huge, but there's something going on here. In fact, that makes sense, right? History matters. Uh, uh, these are humans, after all, in these days. Uh, so um, um, Apologies, uh, taking a couple extra minutes here, but uh, let, me, let me get through this. Uh, you can use, uh, I show you all the code in the book to do this. You can then use the distance matrix to just plot up the correlations on the map. So let me, let me finish with a slide where I show you how to do that. And this is all in the book, but I think that you'll see that you, you want to visualize these things. So now I'm plotting, here's spatially, longitude on the horizontal, latitude on the vertical. The latitude and longitude are in the data. Right? They're in the package. I give them to you so you can make this plot right away. And um, so these are where the islands are. And now I've drawn edges to connect these nodes where the shading represents the correlation that comes from the uh, Gaussian process prior. Yeah? So you can see the effect of distance uh, from this. So you see that there's this little triangle here uh, with lots of stuff being traded around historically. And so what happens to these, some of these islands is that they get more tools because they're near other islands that had more tools. Yeah. Uh, also, the opposite can happen. Uh, you, you can get fewer tools because you're near uh, islands with, that were small. Um, but mainly, there are, there are positive effects of being near big places. Um, so uh, uh, another way to visualize this is on the prediction scale, the relationship to log population now on the horizontal. There's still a big effect of that. Right? The, the effective log population is still very powerful after we've accounted for the spatial autocorrelation. And then, uh, same thing, same edges, but now they're drawn in this different outcome space. And you can see the thing that these islands are being tugged below expectation because they're small and they're near one another. Um, some of these others, uh, Fiji is probably being pulled up by Tonga, uh, which is very large, uh, and so on. So the correlations aren't very powerful, but you can plot them with these edges and get some sense about what's going on in the data. Again, the, all the horoscopic uh, stuff applies. With other data sets, there'd be some other sensible way to do this. This may not be the right way to do it. Um, OK. Uh, so apologize for going over a couple minutes here. Um, I hope it was worth your time. Uh, homework. You love homework, yeah? So we're going to take next week off, uh, not have class next week. So you can take your time with this homework. Um, and then we'll finish up. The week after, with on, on Wednesday and Friday lessons with chapter 14 of the book. Uh, the homework I'd like you to do to practice chapter 13 is M3, M4, and H1. Uh, I think these these will help you be the most valuable ones for you. Um, and then, I should say next week, it's, sorry, not next week, the week after next, you'll come back. Uh, we'll talk about missing data and measurement error and enlightenment. All right. Uh, enjoy your week off. And uh, thanks for your indulgence.